I want to tell you a little bit about the series, which is um, bringing live authors to campus. We don't like to bring the dead ones here. It's a little complicated. Um, but we really try to bring uh, literature to the campus and community here in Dubuque, um, understanding that literature is actually produced here and now. That's and, and I sort of, I have my standard pitch, but I was really thinking to them, like, you know, how am I mixing this up? And here's the truth. Like, I ask my students all the time, who are your favorite writers? Frost, Poe. I'm like, who's alive? So one of the real sort of impetus for me behind um, bringing, bringing the series to campus is to, to let our students know that we writers, we live, we're alive and practicing, and literature is, is being produced around you. And um, you know, some of what's great in the future is, is happening right now. We were fortunate to have Roxanne Gay here on campus a few semesters ago, Patricia Smith, who's just won like, I don't know, six gazillion prizes. Um, David Mira, we just have really wonderful people who are able to, to come by and share their work as it's happening with you. Um, I also think in the context of college, um, I know I'm throwing this one in because f I think maybe for the first time my students are writing on the author who is here. And we spend a lot of time in class really not trying to figure out what was the author thinking because the answer to that of course is not in the story. Um, however, we have a fine opportunity, a gift if you will, of the author actually being here so we can ask her some questions tonight which is always fun. Um, and then here's the last thing and it's totally corny but also maybe the truest thing of all because I think for me this idea of reading when we think of a reading, it's a very solitary act, right? You know, you and your book and the text and the pages. But when you have a live reading like this, we have a, a different sort of journey, a different sort of opportunity. We have community, we have conversation, and we have the opportunity to just um, take a journey that we usually do by ourselves um, with a group of people who are, who are in it with us. So for me, that's one of the, the biggest gifts uh, or opportunities of, of a series like this. Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome our reader tonight, Rebecca Mackay. Rebecca holds an MA from Middlebury uh, College's Breadloaf School of English and a BA from Washington and Lee University, which I realized today we were talking, my advisor also went to that school, so they produce really good people. Um, she also is one of the rare breeds of writers that these days anyway, who doesn't have an MFA. She didn't go you know, to study writing, it just apparently happened. We'll talk about that <laughs> later. <laughs> Her short fiction has been anthologized in Best American Short Stories 2008, 9, 10, and 11, The Best American Non-Required Reading 2009, New Stories from the Midwest, and Best American Fantasy. She's been featured on Public Radio International's Selected Shorts and This American Life. She writes for Harper's and Tin House and The Wall Street Journal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, she's fancy um, and wonderful writer. Her first novel, The Borrower, which I think, is that the one that sold out? No, the other one was sold out. Oh, yeah. yeah, she's sold out already back there. Um, but the, the one. <laughs> that's the one, the one. The Borrower was a bookless top 10 debut, a next indie next pick, an O magazine. You know, if Oprah says it's good, you got to believe that, right? Um, her second novel, The Hundred Year House, appeared in uh, July of 2014. And it's the story of a haunted house and a haunted family told in reverse. Um, it was also chosen as Chicago Writers Association Novel of the Year and got rave reviews in the New York Times and elsewhere. Um, and her latest work, a collection of stories called Music for Wartime, came out this summer. Um, that is the collection from which many of you are reading stories right now. Um, as you know, if you've been reading, or if not, I'm here to testify, her writing is witty and fun and funny and moving and captivating. Um, I was totally charmed and moved by so much of it, and so I'm very excited to bring her here to you at UD. Um, please welcome Rebecca Mackay. Thank you, all of you, and thank you for being here. Um, it was really fun to meet some of you today in class, and see, it's great to see others of you now. Um, and I really appreciate the invitation. This is not a part of Iowa that I've ever been to before, which um, I do remember that I have to tell you, I, I was driving through Galena on my way here, and I had this memory suddenly come back to me of being taken, like my fifth grade class being taken to Chicago to see some guy's one-man show about Galena, Illinois. And he sat there for like two hours and sang songs about Galena. And they all started coming back to me as I was driving through Galena, which was a really weird experience. Um, 
So um, I'm going to read to you from Music for Wartime, which is my collection. And um, I'm going to read things that I don't think those of you who've been reading my working class. That's always, at least it was closed, because that would have been a really dramatic way, actually, to start the reading. <laughs> put that on the floor. Um, I'm going to read stories that I don't think those of you who've been reading my work have read. Um, one of them is very, very short. It's the first story in the collection, and it's, um, it's uh, Lauren introduced me by talking about my being funny, and I promise you the next thing I read will be silly and weird. Uh, this one is, is um, a bit of a downer, so, but it's just very short, um, and it's called The Singing Women. The composer, with his tape recorder, crossed the barricades at night and crawled through the hills into the land his father had fled. Between the clotheslines, three cottages were still inhabited. Three old women still tended gardens and made soup and dusted once a month the trinkets of those killed. Once a month, they made their way through empty houses, empty streets, empty stores, empty churches. Once a month, they spoke the names of the dead. The composer surprised the three women by speaking their dialect, knowing their words for spoon and daffodil and hat. At first they feared he'd been sent by the dictator as a spy. Yet who but the son of a native son would know the story of the leaf child, the rhyme about the wolf maiden? He lived with them a week and recorded, this had been his purpose, their songs, of which they were the world's last three singers a song of lamentation, a song of mourning, a song of protest and despair. They had forgotten the song for weddings. Back safe across the border, the composer set scores around the songs, made records of string instruments wailing behind the women's voices. He was fulfilled. He had preserved before its last breath their culture. When the dictator learned of the record, he became enraged. Not over the songs, what was a lamentation to a dictator, but over the evidence of life in a village he had been assured was wiped out in its entirety. One October morning, he sent his men to finish the job. But I've made it sound like a fable, haven't I? I've lied and turned two women into three, because three is a fairy tale number. All right, so now I'll cheer you up, I promise. Um, so um, I'm going to read you a full story that's, um, that's a little bit longer from later in the collection, although I, I'm cutting some parts out of it. Um, and um, this, the collection, um, you know, the, the title Music for Wartime is not the title of one of the stories. That's often where a writer will take the title for a collection. It'll be the name of a story or a poem. There is no story in here called Music for Wartime. Um, instead, those are really two of the big themes of the collection. There's a lot of music in here. There are a lot of other arts, too. Not every story is about music. And there's a lot of war um, or other kinds of strife and trouble. And what all the stories, the question that all the stories are asking is what it means to try to make beauty, to try to make art, to try to make order in the midst of a brutal and chaotic world. None of the stories is answering that question, but what they're all doing is asking it in a different way paraphrasing the question. So you just heard a, a pretty literal version of that. Um, this is another very literal version. Um, and I, I never know, I'm talking to people, um, it's not like this is something that was you know, my era and, and is not the college students right now, but you guys know who Johann Sebastian Bach was, the composer? Okay, um, 18th century German composer with like a white wig that goes like this, very serious guy. Okay. Um, the story is set in the modern day, but as you'll see, he's in the story. It's called Couple of Lovers on a Red Background. I've been calling him Bach so far, at least in my head, but now that he's started wearing my ex-husband's clothes and learned to work the coffee maker, I feel it's time to call him Johann. I said it out loud once when I needed him to get off the couch before the super came up, but he didn't respond. He went to the vacuum closet only because I practically carried him. No easy task pushing someone so big and sweaty, even with the weight he's lost since he got here. I would take him out for some real German food, but if there's one thing I've learned from the movies about caring for transplanted historical people, it's never to take them out in public among the taxis and police and department store mannequins. 
I've kept the curtains closed and the TV unplugged, but I did introduce him to the stereo so he'd have something to do every day while I'm gone. I'm proud of how carefully I did it. First, I dug my angel music box out of the Christmas decorations and played it for him. He seemed familiar with the concept, so I pointed back and forth between the angel box and the CD player, then put on some handle. He was pleased, not at all scared, and now he's pushing buttons and changing discs like he was raised on Sony. At first, I only let him have Baroque, but recently we've been moving up in history. He's fond of Mozart, unsurprisingly, but for some reason Tchaikovsky makes him giggle. When I played him Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy, I thought he was going to wet the couch. Five minutes later, he went to the piano and played the main part from memory, busted out laughing at certain phrases. If such a thing is possible, he played it sarcastically. He has a laugh, incidentally, like you'd expect from a pot-smoking 13-year-old, whispered and high-pitched. At first, when I thought I was making this all up, I wondered if I'd borrowed that bit from the movie Amadeus. But on the phone the other day, my mother said, who's that laughing over there? At least she thinks I'm dating again. He doesn't seem to remember living in the piano. He never lifts the lid to look inside, which I would certainly do if I'd lived there 10 days. The morning he came, I was in my sweats playing his minuet in G the one you know if you ever took lessons, the first real piece you learned by a serious composer. Da 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 da. I was remembering that the day I learned to play it was the same day my father, the journalist who wished he were an opera baritone, first took interest in my lessons. I was seven. He would stand behind me and beat time on his palm. He even made up a little song for it when I wasn't getting the rhythm right. This is the way that Bach wrote it. This is the way that Bach wrote it. And I would keep playing even though it panicked me. And I'd think of the picture from my cartoon book about Beethoven, the one where his father stood behind the piano with dollar signs in his eyes. I wasn't gifted enough that my father was thinking of money. Maybe he wanted me to entertain at his dinner parties or just to be better than he was. Trouble clefts in his eyes. I was remembering all this, playing the minuet in G pretty damn well, despite a few glasses of wine, when I felt something stuck in my throat. Since my hands were busy, I didn't cover my mouth, just turned my head and coughed something up. I think I passed out then, although I don't remember waking. There's a bit of time I can't account for. I remember being in the kitchen later. I remember making tea. The next day, I heard scratching inside my piano and figured I had mice again. I didn't want to open the lid and poke them out with the end of a mop. I didn't want them running panicked across the carpet, their terror feeding mine. The piano is an old upright, a cheap Yamaha that Larry, my ex, bought used right out of college, before he even bought a couch. Well, not my ex yet, my almost ex, my ex in progress. I thought, if mice eat the insides, it's an excuse to get something nicer. The scratching kept on almost a week, and every time I hit a note, something would scurry around, hit against the strings. I stopped playing the piano. One morning, I was sitting at my little glass table eating breakfast, getting my papers ready for the condo I was going to show, and the lid of the piano lifted up. I'm not a big screamer. In fight or flight situations, I tend to pick option C, freeze. I just sat there paralyzed and out climbed what I can only describe as a small troll. It was about a foot tall and it moved so fast I didn't even notice its clothes or hair. It ran smack into the side of the couch, then out to the middle of the floor where it scampered in smaller and smaller circles. I held my papers in front of my legs like a shield, chased it into the closet and shut the door. Assuming it was a hallucination, what else would I think? I tried to put it out of my mind because I had 20 minutes to find a cab, get across the city, and tell the Lindquists why they should invest their 800,000 in a walk-up with non-perpendicular hallways. It's possible that I also wanted an excuse to get the hell out of there. It's a beauty, I told the Lindquists, very raw and so close to street level, it's almost earthy. But Mrs. Lindquist tapped her nails on the mantel and said it didn't feel like home. I was sure everything would be better when I got back and saw the empty closet. 
I reminded myself I'd been dehydrated, that I should drink more than just alcohol and coffee. But when I got home, I found my guest fully grown, just a little shorter than me, sleeping on the couch. I had no idea who he was at first. His clothes looked ancient, but I'm not good at fashion history. All I could tell was old, grimy, European, too much lace at the cuffs for my taste. He doesn't have a, a wig like in his pictures, just messy, reddish, greasy hair. But after I stared at him half an hour, he woke up and walked to the piano and started to play. Scales at first, like he was getting used to it, and then he launched into a couple of those inventions that drove me crazy in high school. So I looked up Bach online, and it's definitely him. The exact same fleshy cheeks, same dark eyes pinched small between thick brows. I decided I should look respectable in the presence of a genius, so I started freshening my face every day in the cab on the way home, not just the way out. I bought a whole pack of razors at Duane Reed and began shaving my legs again. I tidied the apartment, too. I cleaned out the freezer, all those Ziplocs of Larry's chili, and I finally filled in the missing light bulbs above the bathroom sink. It was startling to see my face so clearly there, loose skin on my eyelids that caught the green eyeshadow in clumps, and my roots growing in gray. I'm only 38. Johan is supposed to be the one with the white hair. I made an appointment for the spa. I introduced Johan to soap and deodorant, and the other day, while I was gone, he finally changed his clothes. Now he's wearing Larry's gray flannel shirt and old corduroys. He looks so normal. Sometimes I glance up and forget it's not just Larry sitting there drinking his beer. When I was 10 years old, my father started the game, you can't get out of the car till you've named this composer. He'd have hidden the cassette case throughout the drive, and he'd only pose the question as he pulled up to the curb where he was dropping me. I would ignore his conversation for blocks, knowing what was coming and concentrating on my guess. My older brother had a practiced method of shouting the name of every major composer in a rapid, memorized succession, a litany that started with Ravel Rachmaninoff, Saint-Saint Beethoven, and ended with Buxtehude, Chopin, Schoenberg, Bernstein. I took the more methodical approach, at least establishing a general period before naming my suspects. Once, when the answer was Smetana, I sat there till I was half an hour late for swim theme. I suppose he'd have been proud of me, identifying Bach so quickly. Johann, no surprise, is remarkable at naming composers. Every time we put in a new disc, I'll say the name loud and clear, Schubert, and he'll repeat it. I'm not sure if he can read the CD covers or if he's used to a more Gothic script. Johann's been learning English. I suppose this shouldn't surprise me when I consider he is a great genius, and he has a good ear and so forth. I came home from an open house the other day and, started, and he started pointing around the room doing nouns. Table, he said, CD player. He must get this from me. I've been talking constantly the way you would with a baby. Things like, now I'm putting milk in your coffee. Mmm, that will taste delicious. On my way out of the elevator the next morning, my super stopped me, bobbed her head, smiling. Such piano you play, you are like concert. Practice, 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 I said. And what propelled me out the door and down the street was a mixture of relief that I'm not crazy and panic that there's a real human being up there who's not just going to vaporize. So calling a shrink is out, but calling anyone else is out too because they'll think I'm crazy. I find myself wishing the Ghostbusters were real. That night, I started telling Johan about my life. I figured if I can't take this to a shrink, maybe he can be my shrink. All they do is sit and listen. So I made us a nice meal, chicken with cream sauce, and opened some Riesling. Johan, I said, I understand you had something like 20 children, babies. I rocked my arms back and forth, and he smiled. Not to bring up a touchy subject, because I know half of them died, right? Dead? He looked confused, but just as well. Back then, I said, people dealt with things and moved on. No one went around wailing, oh, why me? Why does God hate me? And that's how I've always looked at things. So last year, Johan, our city was attacked. Let's just say they knocked down some castles. I pantomimed it idiotically with my arms. 
And we're all terrified, and no one can eat and no one can sleep, granted. But to Larry, who didn't even lose anyone he knew, it makes him, it threatens his whole worldview, makes him question his religion. I say, so your whole vague, lapsed Episcopal belief in God was based on those buildings being there? On nothing bad ever happening? It was like he'd never previously registered that there was evil in the world. This is the man whose clothes you're wearing. And then Larry says, I was more upset when we miscarried last year than when the towers got hit. True, true, but really that was the hormones. Johan, you would not believe how the chemicals can wash over you. He nodded, used his bread to sop up sauce, yawned. I don't know if nodding is something he learned from me or if they did that in old Germany. He was looking very American right then with the haircut I gave him. And his breath has been so much better since he learned to use the electric toothbrush. I assigned him the removable brush head with the blue edging. I have the pink. And he's not that old, really, maybe 40. I looked him up again online to make sure I hadn't altered history, stealing him away like that in the middle of his life. But he still seems to have died at 65. I didn't learn much else new, except that he never liked pianos, didn't think they'd last. Which is all to say, he's not bad looking. It makes you think. Technically, he's a married man, but even more technically, his second wife died 300 years ago. And it's not as if I can go out on dates now and leave him alone, and I can't bring anyone back here. Then there's this. He had 20 children. He's clearly very fertile. And any child of his would be a musical genius. His sons certainly were, and his daughters might have been, given the chance. Could that be the reason this happened? So I can have his daughter and give her a decent shot at life? The question, then, is how to seduce an 18th century German. If I just show up in a nightgown, he'll think I'm some kind of harlot. I did it by introducing jazz. We went chronologically, from my African Rhythms CD through Dixieland, and by the time we got through two bottles of wine and up to Coleman Hawkins, he was leaning close, murmuring things in German. I wasn't expecting much. Every month in Cosmo, they keep announcing some new sex position, as if for years people reproduced like Puritans and were only now figuring out the pleasure aspect. But Johan, he knows exactly what he's doing. I try not to talk on the phone in front of him, since he can't understand that I'm not talking to him. He'll laugh when I laugh, try to stand in front of me, nod when he thinks I'm asking a question. When I got in the cab the morning after our first night together, I turned on my cell for the first time in two days and found a message from Larry. It's me, he said. I could picture him standing with the phone, his back to the smudgy window of his efficiency. Wondering if my shoe polish is still there in the hall closet, call me. I haven't known Larry to polish his shoes in the past 10 years, so this meant he had a date or wanted me to think so. I called his landline since he'd be at work. I talked to his voicemail. Me, I said, Wednesday morning. If you left any polish, it's probably gone. My friend moved some things in, so I had to make space. My friend John, nothing too serious, but he's staying a while. When I finished, a pre-recorded woman asked if I'd like to review my message. I would. I taped over it. Me, sorry I took so long. Can't find the polish. It was old anyway, wasn't it? You should just buy some new. So, good luck with whatever the shiny shoes are for. The cabbie smiled in the rear view. If he understood my English, he probably approved of my benevolence. Johan is obsessed now with jazz, especially blues. Funny, I'd have pegged him for a Charlie Parker fan, something more complex. He still speaks only a few words of English, coffee, eat, pajamas, no, but he's memorized a number of blues lyrics. Across the table most nights, between dinner and ice cream, he'll start into something like, what did I do to be so black and blue? And he even does that low gravelly satchmo voice. No joys for me, no company, even the mouse ran from my house all my life through. I've been so black and blue. Only he's grinning when he sings it. I think he's proud of himself. When he plays from the Chopin book I got him, it sounds different than it should. 
sharper, less romantic, I suppose. But then there's something wonderful about the way he plays fantastical music in this normal, rhythmic way, as if it weren't Chopin at all, just Hannon warm-up exercises. It reminds me of a Chagall painting. Here are some people floating above a town. Here is a cow on the roof. Here is the blanket sky poked through with blinding stars. But this is just the way my town looks at night. I took my easel into the street to paint my flying neighbors to get the purple starlight right. Normal, normal, nothing romantic going on here. I gave him some staff paper the other day, thinking maybe he'd write something while he's here, but he just looked at it, said, nine, nine. Maybe it's against the rules to compose here, maybe to leave, part of, to leave parts of his genius as evidence. Maybe he can leave his sperm, but not his handwriting. The art professor who introduced me to Chagall in the first place would use a piano during lectures. The class met in the small recital theater at the back of the fine arts building, and there was a Steinway on the stage. He loved to run from his projection screen to that piano, talking about colors are like notes, together they make chords. He probably thought he was being quirky. This is blue and green, he said, playing C and D together. So similar they create tension. Now blue and yellow, a third. Now blue and orange, a fourth. But I was never sure he knew what he was talking about. Colors have no innate meaning, he said, but they have connotations we all share as humans, yes? Green tunes us into nature, life. Blue is sky, we think dreamy, ethereal. Red, we see blood, so violence, drama, excitement, passion. That is where I took exception, where I still do. For men, yes, maybe, but for any woman since the dawn of time, red means no baby this month. It means, for better or worse, the staining and unignorable absence of a baby. I lied before. The sex is not that good. I had low expectations, so I was thrilled he knew anything. But actually, he's pretty stiff, non-creative. I've tried things a couple times, normal things for our society, and he has pulled away from me, started talking fast in German, turned bright pink. The last time he did it, I put my clothes on and decided to ignore him for the rest of the day. I went to the window and opened the curtains. I wasn't thinking about it, but maybe on some level I did it to scare him. He stood staring down at the cars, saw all the buildings, saw for the first time how high we are. He didn't cry, but he stayed there a long time, shaking and mumbling. Then he closed the curtains and ran to the couch, ran bent over at the waist like he was scared of falling. I'm surprised he never opened the curtains himself while I was at work. You'd think a genius would be more curious than that. To calm him down, I got my music encyclopedia off the shelf and showed him all the pictures in the box section. The house where he was born, the church in Leipzig, a portrait of his oldest son. Then I got out the little Chagall book I'd bought at MoMA. Here, I said, and I opened it to the painting called The Fiddler. This is what I think of when you play Chopin. See how he's making music floating there above the town? That's what you sound like, like there's nothing under your feet, but you don't even notice. Bach squinted at the picture, pointed at the fiddler's face. Green, he said. Yeah, it's green. I wouldn't make fun. You looked strange enough yourself when you were 12 inches tall. I flipped to the one called Couple of Lovers on a Red Background. The one where they're lying in red, and they're red themselves, drowning in it, only they're not drowning because up above is a huge blue pool where the real water is, where the blue man throws flowers and the fish bird jumps down. These are pictures of love, I said. Love. Everyone in these pictures can float because they're in love, or they're the fiddler on the roof, or they're just happy. I pointed out the window. That's why we can stay up here so high. It doesn't seem possible, but it is. 27 stories up. I flashed my fingers in two tens and a seven. Because we're playing music and we're happy. He crawled back to the window, his nails digging into the carpet, then lifted just the corner of the curtain. Together, we watched a bus shed passengers 27 stories down. Then he looked at me and pointed at the wristwatch I'd given him, the one Larry left behind because it wasn't digital. 
You want to know how long the building can hold up against gravity? Although maybe it was something else. How long must he stay here? How many lifetimes have passed since his own? What time is it in Germany? Tak, 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 he said. I chose to answer the gravity question because it was the only one I could. A long time, long time. It won't fall down while you're here, at least. Since that afternoon, when he sings the blues, it sounds like the blues. I'm so forlorn, he sings. Life's just a sorn. My heart is torn. Why was I born? What did I do to be so black and blue? He won't look out the window anymore, but it doesn't matter. He knows. Every siren he hears now, he looks at that curtain. I've never been in the blissful ignorance camp, but maybe in this case it was just too much for one man to handle. Sometime last October, Larry made us stop watching TV so we wouldn't see bad news. I couldn't understand how it worked for him, because for me it was worse. If we don't watch the news, I said, how do we know the city is not on fire? How do we know we're not the last ones alive? Johann's been turning pale, and if I'm not mistaken, he's getting smaller. You can see it around the eyes, the way they're sinking back into his face. He hardly leaves the couch anymore, and when he does, when he finally gets his courage and dashes to the bathroom, it's with shaking legs and outstretched arms, like he's worried the floor will give way any moment. He has scratched the arms of the sofa to shreds. Yesterday, I played the piano to see if he would follow suit. I brought out my big blue Gershwin book and got through a foggy day with only three or four mistakes. I'm good if a little rusty. At the end of high school, I was even applying to conservatories, getting ready to go on auditions when I realized that although I could play almost anything you put before me and skillfully, I'd never gotten through a major piece without an error. I could play the whole pathétique flawlessly, and then a measure from the end, I'd breathe a sigh of relief and flub the last chord. And so I majored in finance. Maybe that's what you are, I told Johan, after I'd messed up the last two measures. Maybe you're my repressed ambition. Not likely, though, the way he sits with his mouth caving in, his glare darting between me and the window. I get the feeling his tock, tock, tock is running out. But if my test sticks are accurate, I started ovulating yesterday. So I only need him to hold out a little longer. We made love twice this morning. I'll buy him a fattening dinner tonight. I had to leave him on the couch at noon, lock the door, ride down in my loud, slow elevator to show the Lindquists their 15th and God, let's hope, final apartment. Johan didn't look good when I left him there, so small and pale, curled in the cushions. I wonder if I'd be as terrified by his 18th century Leipzig, or if there's something intrinsically horrifying about our modern world, about the, this new century, something we can only handle because we've been so slowly inured to it. At other moments today, I've wondered too if Johann shriveling in on himself is in fact a sign that part of me is coming back to life. I have to make money, I said as I left, Deutschmarks, right? I'll need to buy things, piano lessons, for the baby. And so I left him. And even if he's still there when I get back, I won't be surprised if he doesn't last the night, if he evaporates by morning. But I never planned on his being in the picture long term. I don't actually want him to raise the baby. It'll be easy enough to explain why he isn't around. Well, the baby's father is quite a famous man, I'll say and this would simply ruin his reputation. Believe me, very famous. Waiting for the elevator, though, I did something I didn't know I was going to do. I took out my phone and called Larry. When he answered, I said, don't talk. I said, it's good that not everyone is like me, born expecting the world to come unpasted. I said, I see it now that you were up there playing a fiddle with no roof to stand on. And one day you just looked down and lost your grip on the air and fell. And I'm sorry. Larry was quiet and then he said, okay. And then he said, I'll call you after work. It occurred to me, of course it did, that if I got back with Larry next week or the week after that, 
he'd never know the baby wasn't his. And who's to say it wouldn't be? Am I the expert on reality these days? On the long ride to the ground floor, I slid on my stilettos, growing three inches even as I sank 300 feet. I put on lipstick and prepared to sell the Lindquists a place to live, a nice plot of air so high above the city, the Indians didn't even think to charge beads for it. I practiced saying, look how convenient and how stable. It'll last a thousand years if nothing knocks it down. I know you're going to love it. Thank you. All right, so I'm really um, happy to talk with you for a few minutes and answer questions, talk to you about writing, the stories I just read, other things, novels, the weather outside, whatever you would like. And the challenge is always getting someone to ask the first question. Yeah. Right. Do you write as you're reading it? I mean, the, do the phrases come slow and deliberate? Um, or is it all fast and... Like as I come, it, it depends. Um, there are times, um, and, and I bet that even you know students who are studying writing right now might have a similar experience. There are times when you're sitting there staring at a word for half an hour and you can't think of what is going to come next. And for me, there are times when it's coming out, it, not for very long, but a sentence will come out so fast that I'm kind of you know stumbling over my own fingers trying to type so that I don't lose the end of the sentence that I just thought of. Um, and where I could almost just close my eyes and sort of keep typing. Um, and so it, it, um, it depends on a lot of things. And it's, um, you'll kind of get into a new idea. And that new idea will take you a certain distance. And so I'm often typing pretty fast at that point. But then I'm stopping and I'm thinking a lot about where things are going to go next. I might even be drawing or outlining on paper, um, brainstorming off the page, and then getting back in. Um, it's you know usually a story will take me a month or two of work. Not that I'm sitting there eight hours a day for an entire month, but I'm coming back to it. Um, there's, there are only a few stories that I've really written quickly. There's a story in this collection that's called The Briefcase. And I wrote that, um, I think, in about three or four days, um, which is really unusual for me, maybe even two or three. Um, I was in a weird, I was pregnant with my first child at that time, and I, I was kind of in a weird headspace. I felt like I was in a bit of a fog. And that sort of helped me, actually, um, this foggy. I kind of was able to tune everything else out and just really be in this weird, almost dreamlike zone. And I really hoped that would happen to me again when I was pregnant with my second child. But the problem was the second time I had a toddler running around. So that really just happened the one time. <laughs> um, but um, usually they're, you know, it's spurts. It's, it's fits and starts, you know? Yeah. Yes? How much uh, time do you spend rewriting um, I usually spend at least as much time editing as writing, if not more. Um, and that, it, you know, part of that is that, you know, some of the editing is right there as you're writing. You write, a, I'm writing a sentence and then I'm looking back over it. And then I'm deleting that sentence and making it something new and then, you know, then combining it with the following sentence. So that, as opposed to just putting actual words, that's a tremendous amount of that is editing. Um, and then, um, and then there's the phase of the story is written, and now I'm going to print it all out and mark it up and lay it out on the floor and cut chunks and move things around. Um, so, um, you know, I'll, I'll tell you right now, for instance, I'm, I'm working on a new novel. My hope is that it would come out three years after this book, so by June of 2018. Um, just that would be nice career-wise, you know. Um, that means it needs to be done and to my editor by June of 2017, because book from a major press takes about a year to produce. Um, so that means I have about a year and a half to finish this book, um, a little bit more. I'm telling myself a year and a half. And um, so the way I'm trying to budget that out, um, and I have, a, I have about half the book done, I'm figuring if I can finish a draft by December, I'll have then a year and a half to edit, which is, I think, what I'm going to need. Um, I'm going to, you know, I, I, can, I can bang out the rest of the draft in a few months, maybe a little bit more than that. But I'm going to need at least a year just to edit the novel. And that's, and that's pretty full-time work. Um, so um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's, it, has, it, it is a much larger proportion of writing time than many people imagine if they haven't really tried writing. Um, 
And, you know, people kind of imagine that the writer sits there in this book-lined room and it's lovely and they write it and then they look over and change a couple of words. And of course, those of us who've been through that um, know that it's actually, um, it's, it's much more sweat on the page um, after the words are out than before sometimes. Yes? Uh, a recent Booker Prize winner is uh, talked about as being rejected 80 times. Mm. Now he's a Booker Prize winner. Mm -hmm. And um, so what was your sort of first foray into the public, getting public? Yeah. Um, I'll say, you know, I think when people first sent, I, I, my, I was originally sending individual short stories to literary journals, um, which is the way that for a lot of people, if they write short fiction, um, you don't just sit down and write a collection and get it published. You write stories, and in each of those stories, if you're lucky, a lot of them get published in magazines or journals that might have just a readership of 500 people. But you start, maybe some of those get anthologized, the right person reads them, you start to build your reputation a little bit, and when you finally have a book, you have something to point to. Um, when you're trying to find an agent, you can say, look, my, my stories have been published. So. Um, for me, that was really it. I was publishing stories individually for a long time before my first novel was done. Um, some of those stories, and this is we're talking about 10, 15 years ago, some of those stories are in this book, even though this book just came out, some of them are quite old. And um, I was very lucky, and it really is luck, um, the first batches of stories that I sent out. I, um, I for one thing, really did my research, though, on what journals were looking for, what kinds of stories. Um, I really worked on polishing things before I sent them out the first time. And in that first batch of stories that I sent, I sent different stories to different journals, and there was one acceptance in there, um, which is not usual. And I feel like that's a really unhelpful story for me to tell anybody who's you know interested in writing. Um, it doesn't really happen that way. Sometimes lightning strikes, and it was the right story for the right editor at the right time. Um, and often, it's just it's a lot of rejection, not necessarily because your story isn't good, but an editor could read your story and like it a lot, but it's so similar to something they published in the last issue or they already have a story about Mexico in this issue that they're planning, or they're full for the next year and a half because they just accepted so much stuff. And you, so you never really know why. Um, or just this editor personally hates stories about dogs or something, you know? Um, so it was just really lucky. And once I started getting published, then it was easier to get published again because it's much easier to say my work just appeared in these journals that, you know, you get a bit of a reputation going. So um, I don't have that, but what I'll, what I'll say, um, my, my big sad rejection story is that, um, and this is the kind of thing that, please, like, this is the, it doesn't leave the room, please. Um, I would never, like, say this in New York City. But um, my, so I, my first book was, my first book was a novel called The Borrower. I was writing short stories the whole time. And, um, I, that really was the right first book for me. Um, short story collections don't sell anywhere nearly as well as novels do um, to the general public. They sell to people who really care about literature, to students, to connoisseurs, I think, but um, most people, like your aunt's book club, you know, they want a novel. And um, so The Borrower was it had kind of a, a catchy hook. It's about a librarian who inadvertently kidnaps a 10-year-old boy so that kind of, you know, that get, got some attention, it got some good sales, and I was really happy, and I was going to do my story collection next. I've been working on these stories forever, and the story collection was done. And my editor at Penguin, who'd published The Borrower, saw the stories and was like, mm, no. <laughs> um, basically, not nothing against the stories. She just kind of felt like, well, story collection isn't going to sell. She was very vague about why she didn't want to publish it. Um, and... I, you know, this is this was going to be my next book. This was going to be my my big book. I was so excited, and then it was like, nah, um, maybe another novel first. Do you have another novel? And so um, I cried a lot for a couple of days, and then I was halfway into another novel, um, which became the Hundred Year House. And so I I just cranked through the rest of this novel draft. Um, not that I wrote fast, but that I didn't do anything but write. Um, for like another six months until it was done. And then um, we sold, my, we being me and my agent, sold both the, the novel and this collection as a two-book deal 
to my editor. It was kind of like, love me, love my cat. You know, like, you, you have to. If you want to publish my novel, you got to publish the stories. And then they really got behind it, actually. Um, I think they realized that there was going to be some support for it. Um, they put it out in hardcover instead of just paperback to start with, which is unusual for a story collection. Um, they got it, you know, they, they really put some... Um, they, they toured me. They sent me around to bookstores. So it's turned out okay. And ultimately, in the long run, it probably was better for my career to have another novel first. Um, but to just, it felt like I just ran smack into a plate glass window of, of the realities of the market. And, you know, you, you feel like you're just creating your art and it's beautiful. And it's all going to be great. And then smack into this, oh, yeah, you actually have to sell books and make money. And the publishing industry has certain expectations. So I do, I, I have my sob stories, and I have more, I won't share, but they're not, for me, about that first foray into publishing, whereas for a lot of people they are. Um, the, the great thing about a career in the arts is you can get rejected at any point. <laughs> you can get, you know, like, you could win the Man Booker Prize and then have some horrible rejection the next year or so. Um, it, it just never stops. It keeps you nicely humble. <laughs> um, do we want to do maybe one, one more question, one or two more questions? Yeah, that's a great question. So for students who don't know, an MFA is a Master's of Fine Arts. And after your bachelor's degree, it's what a lot of people pursue. They're, you could do an MFA in music or studio art or writing. Um, and um, I basically, I graduated from college um, feeling like I, I wanted to, you know, make some money pay back my parents for, pay back my mother specifically for the money she'd invested in me for college, you know, was just financials of it were like, I need to make some money. And um, so I, I became um, a Montessori elementary teacher, um, which I did for about 12 years. And um, so I did a kind of a year of training and then I, I had a job offer, this is kind of why I did it. Partway through college, I'd gotten this job offer at a school where I sometimes helped in the summers. Um, and I loved that job, um, it was, um, really full throttle, the kind of thing I could really only could have done in my 20s when I had more energy and didn't have my own kids. Um, but always with the the hope that I was going to continue writing. And I felt like, you know, it's teaching younger kids, teaching Montessori. I didn't have homework to grade. I had the summers off. So it, it felt to me strategically, and it was, um, a good move to still be able to, to pursue my writing. And in the meantime, I got a master's in literature over the summers. Um, which is the one sh um, that Lauren mentioned from Middlebury College in Vermont. Um, but that was, you know, reading Chaucer and stuff. That wasn't, that wasn't my own writing. And um, although in that program there were um, several creative classes that I was able to take. So I was able to study poetry with Paul Muldoon, who's now the poetry editor of The New Yorker, and I studied fiction. And um, basically um, just kept working, kept reading, would go... S I think just once went to a sort of a summer writers conference um, where I got workshopped and got some really intensive feedback. Um, but I, um, and, and my, honestly, I have, I have really good readers in my life. I have one of the main benefits of an MFA, and I teach in several MFA programs. Now I teach at the Iowa Writers Workshop and I teach at Northwestern in their MFA program. Um, and so I've seen the other side of it. I know what you get out of an MFA program, um, which is mostly feedback. Um, you get time and space to write, but you get feedback. And um, I'm lucky that I, I was able to find people in my own life to give me tremendous feedback. Um, my, my husband is a really good editor. Weirdly enough, my mom is a great editor, and I know most people would not share their work with their mom first thing, um, but she's, she's really sharp at catching, catching little details and typos and um, all those things, and, and other people in my life are great at you know, asking me the big questions about where's the story going or why did you do this? What's it about? So um, that's that's pretty much been it. And, and the irony of it all is I've come back around and I'm I'm teaching again and, and I'm teaching in MFA programs without an MFA. But um, but people the people who run those and the people in them I think fully understand it's not some specialized training that you can only get there. Um, it's a matter of sharing what you know about craft and that there are many different routes to find those things out. So, we're good. Yeah. Um, 
You know, it's interesting because I think it's a different answer than the answer would be to, you know, who are your favorite writers necessarily. But um, I think that um, Nabokov um, is, so if, um, those of you who are students, if you've heard of the book Lolita, which is a, a wonderfully controversial book, um, he's a very strange writer. He lies, his characters lie to you constantly. And I love that idea of an unreliable narrator, a narrator who might not be telling you the truth. So in The Borrower, my first novel, this librarian who's kidnapped this kid, obviously something's a little wrong with her, um, but she also, she lies to you constantly. And, um, and the, the narrator I just read to you, I mean, she's, she's pretty unreliable in several ways. She might not be accurately depicting what's going on in her apartment, or maybe she is. Um, so um, I love him. I love um, the writers who push me outside of my own comfort zone and, and show me things that I didn't know fiction could do. Um, a writer, a really underrated writer um, working right now named Julie Otsuka, who um, she wrote a book called The Buddha in the Attic um, most recently, and um, which was nominated for the National Book Award. So she's getting recognition, but I feel like people should, she should be a household name. Um, she does things with fiction where it's it's much sometimes much more like poetry than like fiction. It's but it's absolutely to me just riveting, um, and I don't know that I've ever written anything like her. But she's this reminder for me um, that fiction can do more than I might instinctively think when I first sit down on a lazy day, and um, so so I love writers like that. And um, you know I think. In, in one way or another, even if I read something that I hate, I'm influenced by it because I'm seeing what that person did that I didn't like and trying to figure out, you know, what is my, if I don't like this, then what is my own aesthetic? Why didn't I like that? What, what exactly was it about it? What would I do differently? Um, I just read Agatha Christie for the first time in my life because I felt like that was something that I should do. And it was, it was great fun. It was not quite, you know, like, I didn't love it. And there were things where it was like, okay, the reason I... You know, it was really driving me crazy how everything was over-explained at the end. These are all murder mysteries. And, you you know, at the end, it's like, oh, so you're saying that the reason the light went out is that Jason flipped the switch. Yes, Jason flipped the switch on the light. That's why it went out. Oh, so the reason that it was dark was that Jason flipped the Yes, that's why the light. And it's just, like, repeated and repeated. And then someone comes in who wasn't in the room. They're like, so why did the light go out? And they say it all over again. Like, she wants to make sure you didn't miss anything. And... Um, it was a reminder to me of like, okay, that's one extreme, and she's writing for a certain audience. I, you know, I'm my pendulum swings a little bit this way. I want people to have to do some work to figure it out. I want people to engage in the book a little more. Um, I want to write stories that maybe you get more out of out of the second time than the first time. And um, you know, and it, as much as I admire and respect what she was doing, she really knew what she was doing. She really knew her audience. Um, but it helps me define my own aesthetic by seeing why I don't do that, why I want to do something else. So, not to diss Agatha Christie. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for being a great audience, and thank you, Lauren, and all of you. And two plugs to make. Again, thank you guys for coming. One, Rebecca is selling and signing books in the back. As I mentioned, is it The Hundred Year House? That one's sold out. That yeah. one is sold out, but you may still get Music for Wartime and The Borrower, which is wonderful. Um, and also, the next Poet in Residence reading is going to be a poet. Um, and more importantly, well, not more importantly, also as important, is the fact that she's our new hire here at the University of Dubuque. She is uh, Dr. Janine Pitas, and that will be on December 3rd. Uh, same bat time, same bat mm -hmm. place. So mm -hmm. hopefully you'll be back. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you.